Hello again. So um, I'm back with <clears throat> the rest of the foundation scripture for you know the last video. Um, starting off with Second Peter two, but we'll start with prayer. Dear Lord Heavenly Father, I just thank you. You are beautiful, and I love you, and I adore you. May your name always be kept holy. And may thy will be done, and thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Lord Heavenly Father, Lord Heavenly Father, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses and forgive us our trespasses that we have, you know, sinned against others, Lord, and, and help us to forgive those who have sinned against us, Lord, as you forgive us. Teach us how, Lord. Show us how to forgive others as you have forgiven us, Lord. Show us how to be merciful. Show us how to be gracious. Show us how to be loving and kind and gentle and humble like you were, Lord. Lord, Heavenly Father, I just thank you. Thank you. Don't let us be delivered into temptation, Lord, for you do not tempt anyone. And Lord, let us be led away from all evil and never be led into evil, for thine is the kingdom, the glory, and the power forever and ever. Hallelujah and amen. Thank you, Lord Yeshua. You're just so beautiful. I was going to take a minute. He is beautiful. And he's worthy of our praise. Um, and if you think I praise too much, um, angels in heaven and elders in heaven in Revelation um, are 24-7 praising him. So, day and night, it says. If I praise too much, what's heaven going to be like for you? <laughs> I'm just curious. Just curious. Um, Second Peter, um, talks at two, chapter two talks about the judgment of false teachers. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and start though in, for, in chapter one with the trustworthiness of the prophetic word that we've been given in second Peter one verse starting in verse 16, it says this. <clears throat> It says, for we did not follow cleverly contrived myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Instead, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when we received honor and glory from God the Father, our voice came to him from the majestic glory. It says, this is my beloved son. I take delight in him. And we heard this voice when it came from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic word strongly confirmed. You will do well to pay attention to it as a lamp shining in a dismal place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. It says, first of all, you should know this. No prophecy or scripture comes from one's own interpretation. It says, because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah and amen. Let that be absolutely 100% true for all of us, Lord. <laughs> in Jesus' name. Um, and so this goes into, you know, um, you know, the judgment of false teachers. You know, they'll instruct, they'll introduce destructive her heresies and even denying their master. You know, um, and if that's not you, or, you know, you say, oh, that's not me. Are you sure? Because Peter thought so too. You know, and, and whose book are we reading right now? So, just you know, point that out. Um, don't be deceived. Don't deceive yourself. Um, <clears throat> it says, but there were, there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, and will bring swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their unrestrained ways in the way of truth. You will be blasphemed because of them. They will exploit you in their greed with deceptive words. Their condemnation pronounced long ago is not idle, and their destruction does not sleep. For God didn't spare the angels who sinned, but threw them down into Tartarus, or that's the Greek name for divine punishment in the underworld. 
and deliver them to be kept in the chains of darkness and judgment. And if he didn't spare the ancient world, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and, he, and seven others, when he brought a flood on the world for of the uh, when he brought a flood on the world of the ungodly, and if he reduced the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes and condemned them to ruin, making them an example to those who are going to be ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, distressed by the unrestrained behavior of the immoral. For as he lived among them, that righteous man tormented himself day by day with the lawless deeds he saw and heard. And the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. It says, especially those who follow the polluting de desires of the flesh and despise authority. It says, bold, arrogant people. They do not tremble when they blaspheme the glorious ones. However, angels who are greater in might, for they're greater in might and power, do not bring a slanderous charge against them before the Lord. It says, but these people, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, speak blasphemies about things they don't understand. And in their destruction, they too will be destroyed, suffering harm as the payment for unrighteousness. They consider it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes, delighting in their deceptions as they feast with you. They delight in their deceptions as they feast with you, as they share the word of God with you. They have eyes full of adultery and are always looking for sin. They seduce unstable people and have hearts trained to, in greed. Children under a curse. They have gone astray by abandoning the straight path and have followed the path of Balaam, the son of Bazor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but received a rebuke for his transgressions. This is what I was talking about earlier about the donkey. It says, a donkey that could not talk, spoke with the human voice and restrained the prophet's irrationality. There's my confidence. There's my confidence. God will make a donkey talk if he has to. Thanks be to God. These people are springs without water, mists driven by a whirlwind. The gloom of darkness has been reserved for them. For by uttering boastful, empty words, they seduce with fleshly desires and debauchery people who have barely escaped from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption since people are enslaved to whatever defeats them. For if having escaped the world's impurity through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in these things and defeated. The last state is worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it, to turn back from the, whole, from the holy command delivered to them. It has happened to them according to the very true proverb. A dog returns to its own vomit and a sow after washing itself while it's in the mud. Well, I guess that explains what I was saying, you know, in the last video, is that I don't know why we do it. That's why. We, we like to return to our own mud. That is why. I still don't know why, but that's, that's what we do. Um, not anymore, though. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Hallelujah and amen. Uh, Let's see. So, you know, the, the destruction of those people, it never sleeps. And so we can't, you know, we can't either. Um, God didn't spare the angels nor the ancient world. Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, Lot was rescued with his family, except the one who looked back and became a pillar of salt. She wasn't salt for the world. She was just salty. She wanted, you know, her old way. She didn't, you know... She was scared what the wilderness and what following God would look like. She didn't know what that would look like, and that was scary. And even though, you know, living amongst the unrighteous was also, you know, scary, it was still more comfortable than the unknown of the following God. And so that's why she turned around. Um, you know, it says presumptuous and self-willed. And don't tr tremble at insulting angelic beings. Again, they don't bring charges to the Lord against them. I don't, they, you know, they, basically Jesus is saying, these are just the notes that I took on these, that chapter, excuse me. It says, can't 
blame your accuser, the devil. You can't blame other people. You can't blame life circumstances. God says we will be held accountable for everything. Because he's, it, it, it says his word has gone out to all the ends of the earth. It says it's done. Um, the humble, this is why the humble are favored. You know, when, when your circumstances are difficult and, you know, people are making your life difficult and, you know, let's say the devil is, you, you know, you've been given a messenger from Satan, you know, uh, like Paul, you know, we can't blame those things. We can't anymore. You know, um, that was one of the things he used for me is I'd, I'd, I'd be like, God, <laughs> how, you know, how am I supposed, that's, again, I kept going back to the how. And that's the problem is we can't. He's already got it already figured out. Um, you know, they'll be paid back for, you know, everything that they've been doing. Um, you know, they're, the, and, and one of the things that they do is they're looking for the sins of others. So they can seduce the unstable people in their lives, you know, with the greed, you know, and it says that they're cursed, um, you know, for following the law and failing because all fail, you know, all fall short of the grace of God. You know, if you fail at one, you fail at all of them, it says, you know, and you're cursed. Um, let's go back into the word, James 2. There it is. And, you know, it even goes in, you know, to the sin of favoritism in this one. It says, brothers, my brothers, do not show favoritism as you hold on to the faith in our glorious Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ. For example, a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes and a poor man dressed in dirty clothes also comes in. If you look with favor on the man wearing the fine clothes, and say, sit here in a good place, and set you, so you say to the poor man, stand over there, or sit over here on the floor, and be my footstool. He's not talking about the people that come in dressed nice to church. Poor people do that. Do they not? Do they not wear their best Sunday still? I mean, you know, like in just a general, term, you know, term. He's talking about the people that aren't clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Do we treat them worse than we treat the people that come in and they're hallelujah, you know, and they're all, what, you know, we cannot favor them over the ones that, that can't have that faith. You know, we're, we're not to favor them, you know, um, they've already, they've been fed. So, you know, we need to be feeding the, the ones that are, you know, standing there in dirty clothes and unable to be clothed in the clothes of righteousness. You know, Jesus even says, you know, you saw me hungry, you saw me thirsty, you saw me naked, and you did not help me. This is what he means. You see them without the garments of God given to us for free. We are to try to help clothe them. We're supposed to feed them says, um, haven't you discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? It says, listen, my dear brothers, didn't God choose the poor in this world to be rich in faith? He did. I, yeah, I make below the poverty line. This is true. <laughs> And, and people picked on me and left me to die because I was poor and too broken. Because I was afflicted by God, they picked on me. For something I cannot control. That's you, I'm sorry. No, I'm not one of them. <laughs> Again, I can't. I'm way too broken and sinful without Jesus too. He says, listen, my dear brothers, didn't... God choose the poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him. It says, yet you dishonored that poor man. Don't the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Don't they blaspheme the noble man, name that was pronounced over you at baptism? Indeed, if you keep royal law prescribed in the scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show favoritism, you commit sin and are 
convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the entire law yet fails in one point is guilty of breaking it all. You're guilty of breaking it all. And so he said, and we all fall short. For he said, who's, for he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. So if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you are a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who will be judged by the law of freedom. For judgment is without mercy to, one, to the one who hasn't shown mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. You know, um, that's why it's faith and works. It goes into faith and works in the, in the rest of the chapter. Um, but I want to, you know... get to you know the other scriptures as well but deuteronomy 27 talks about this too it's deuteronomy As, um, the law written on stones. Um, and we're living stones. So I'm actually going to read the whole thing. It says, Moses and the elders of Israel commanded the people, keep every command I'm giving you today. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is all the laws of the prophet are fulfilled in that one command. So we don't have to worry about any of the other ones and what he's talking about. It says, at the, at the time you crossed the Jordan into the land of the Lord, the land the Lord your God has given you, you must set up large stones and cover them with plaster. It says, um, you know, once you've been baptized, you know, that's what it, it read to me. Once you've passed through the waters, you've been baptized by the water and the spirit, and, you know, you've had, you're full of the Holy Spirit, and you've gone into the land that he's given you, you know, it says, write all the words of this law on the stones after you cross to enter the land the Lord your God has given you, a land of flow, land flowing with milk and honey, as Yahweh, the God of your fathers, has promised you. When you have crossed the Jordan, you are to set up these stones on Mount Ebal to cover them with plaster. Build an altar of stones there to the Lord your God. You must not use any iron tool on them. Use uncut stones to build the altar of the Lord your God and offer burnt offerings to the Lord your God on it. We are, we are the sacrifice. We are the altar. We're the, we're the whole shebang. So, but we still, if we want to follow this old covenant, here you go. Here is what you get to have. If you would like to have your own self-righteousness and, and build your own church and um, follow your own God. It says, the person who makes a carved idol or cast image, which is detestable to the Lord, the work of a craftsman, and sets it up in secret, is cursed. And all the people will reply, Amen. The one who dishonors his father or mother is cursed. And all the people will say, Amen. The one who moves his neighbor's boundary mark is cursed. And all the people will say, Amen. The one who leads a blind person astray on the road is cursed. And all the people will say, Amen. The one who denies justice to a foreigner, a fatherless child, or a widow is cursed. It says, and all the people will say amen. The one who sleeps with his father's wife is cursed, for he has violated his father's marriage bed. And all the people will say amen. The one who has sexual intercourse with any animal is cursed, and all the people will say amen. The one who sleeps with his sister, whether his father's daughter or his mother's daughter, is cursed, and all the people will say Amen. Um, if you secretly kill your neighbor, which he, Jesus says, if you hold hate in your heart, you're, ki you're killing your neighbor. Um, you're guilty of murder, says, and all the people say amen. The one who accepts a bribe to kill an innocent person is cursed. The one who accepts, you know, that, um, you know, a bribe to, to, you know, oh, I'm righteous. And that person, you know, it's basically... It says, anyone who doesn't put the words of this law into practice is cursed, and all the people will say amen. And then in verse, or I mean, chapter Deuteronomy 28, it says, all the people, you know, are the blessings for obedience is what it is. It says, all these blessings will come and overtake you because you obey 
where it says, Now if you faithfully obey the Lord your God and are careful to follow all his commands I am giving you today, the Lord your God will put you far above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come and overtake you because you obey the Lord your God. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. Your descendants will be blessed in your land's produce and the offspring of your livestock, including the young of your herds and the newborn of your flocks. Your basket and kneading bowl will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. And he's not talking, that's not prosperity. He's talking about you're going to be blessed with the fruits of the Spirit. And when you go out in the fruit and the Spirit, you know, all those things that you are planting and sowing in the Spirit are going to prosper. Um, in Matthew 5, 17 through 20. says don't assume that it came to destroy the law this is jesus law or the prophets i did not come to destroy but to fulfill he says for i assure you until heaven and earth pass away not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all things are accomplished therefore whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches people to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven but whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven says, for I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. And it's because they, they knew the whole word. <laughs> they had it memorized. And yet they didn't put into practice what they knew, what they had memorized. Um, John 19.30, and you know, um, it says when things are accomplished, heaven and earth will pass away. Well, Jesus already said it was. He says it's done. It's been accomplished. He says it's accomplished. He says it's done. Um, I'm going to go to John chapter 19, verse 30. It actually came to me, you know, Jesus' burial, you know, um, they were afraid of the Jews, and so, you know, even though they did a really nice thing by burying Jesus, you know, they were still hiding from the Jewish people. They were still hiding from the people, and so, you know, that was very random, but it just, you know, I, I felt like God showed me that for a reason, so I share it with you. So this is John chapter 19, and I'm going to start at verse 30. Um, actually, I'm going to start at 28. I'm sorry. It says, after this, when Jesus knew that everything was now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I'm thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there, so they fixed a sponge full of sour wine on his up and held it up to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he says, this is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. And so, are we giving God and G are we giving Jesus bitter wine to ease his pain, to ease his suffering? Is he thirsting and hungering for righteousness? And are we giving him poison food? And are we giving him bitter living water? What I hope. Um, in John chapter 12, um, he's just, he just gave me my hope again and my joy back. He was just like, you're okay, child. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Um, actually, I'm going to start John 12, uh, chapter 30. It says, Jesus responded, this actually, um, Actually, 27, it says, now my soul is troubled. Forget it. I swear I'm not getting this. John 12, 24, it says, I assure you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains by itself. But if it dies, it produces a large crop. That's why Jesus had to die. That's why we have to die to ourselves. It says, the one who loves his life will lose it. And the one who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. 
Let me read that again. It says, the one who loves his life will lose it. And the one who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there my servant also will be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. And then he says, now my soul is troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour. But that is why I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others says, said that it was an angel had spoken to him. So they heard the voice of God and they were disputing over it. Of what they heard. Immediately. Immediately. God spoke the vision. <laughs> and then Jesus responded. This voice came not for me, but for you. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. As for me, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He said this to signify what kind of death he was about to die. Um, he says, then the crowd replied to him, we have heard that the scripture, see, now they're, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to, you know, reason with what they've read in the scripture. It says, um, we've heard from the scripture that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the son of man must be lifted up? Who is this son of man? Jesus answered, the light will be with you only a little longer. Walk while you have the light so that the darkness doesn't overtake you. The one who walks in darkness doesn't know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. Jesus said this, then went away and hid from them. And so, you know, um, he puts that light in us. He, you know, we are the lights in the world. We are to be taking the gospel out. We are to be his hands and feet. You know, beautiful are the feet of the one delivering the gospel of the good news. Um, and so he says it. Now is the time for this world to be judged. Now the ruler of this world will be expelled. You know, and Jesus, as I said, as for me, when I'm lifted up from earth, I will draw everyone to myself. You know, and it's to show him the death he would die. Um, and, and walking is to believe. Remember that, you know, the work of God is to believe. Um, and Isaiah, you know, he says he blinded their eyes, hardened their hearts so they can't see with their eyes. You know, and that's so that they would see with their hearts. You know, you must be humble to be able to, to heal. He says, you know, it, so they can't see with their eyes so I could heal them. If we're just looking with our with our eyes, our worldly eyes, we're not going to see it. We're going to miss it. Um, I'm guilty of it. I, you know, was very much so missing it. Even though I was very much producing fruits of the Spirit, I was still missing it. I, too, missed it. It's okay. And, and, and in the last year and a half, I mean. <laughs> like, since I've been saved, I have missed it as well. And I've missed the mark a lot. A lot. Um, you know, and Jesus talks about only speaking the Father's words. And if, if, if Jesus, the Son of God, couldn't do anything on his own and he could only speak what the Father told him to speak and only do as the Father told him to do, if the Son of God had to do that in order to be obedient, how much more us? Right. But he says that we're going to be able to do greater things. Right. You know, he says the one living in you is greater than he who is in the world. And that means everybody and everything. Um, so hallelujah. Um, in Revelation 20. And so this is, you know, just to kind of connect that it's done. It's over. You know, when us fighting over it and all that is not it's not going to get us anywhere. Revelation um, 20, you know. It's the devil was locked away, so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and read it because Jesus, you know, um, said it in John 12, right? And so now we're in Revelation 20. It says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with a key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for 1,000 years. He threw him into the abyss, closed it, and put a seal on it 
so that he could no longer deceive the nations until a thousand years were completed. After that, he must be released for a short time. It says, Then I saw thrones and people seated on them who were given authority to judge. I also saw the people who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of God's word, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and who had not accepted the mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and raised with the Messiah for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come, and come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. It says, but they will be priests of God and of the Messiah, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. First Peter 2 9 says, you are a chosen race. A holy priesthood. And, and, and it talks about we're, you know, living stones. We're, we are the temples of God and we're not to defile the temples of God. Um, the rest of the dead, you know, the ones not alive in Christ, they'll come, they don't come alive until it's over. The second resurrection, you know, so this is the first, you know, blessed are the ones who come alive in Christ. Um, life in the abundance of the kingdom. Um, I also put, you know, again, their hearts are deceitful. Our, our hearts are deceitful. Um, the devil can't deceive us. We're deceiving ourselves. We can and so can others. Um, once the thousand years are over, though, and he goes to deceive and gathers the numbers. I'm going to go ahead and just keep reading that. Um, it says, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And, and this is one of the things I was talking about in, in one of the clips, you know, the little short clips, is that, you know, he's building a kingdom and he's not going to come until he knows he's got enough soldiers to be able to, to defeat the enemy. I mean, he knows, I mean, he, he knows, you know, that's why the father knows. He knows exactly what that number is going to be. You know, we, we have no idea. We couldn't possibly know because it's, I mean, it says they, their number is like the sand of the sea. And the sand of the seashore is another um, translation. It says they came up over the surface of the earth and surrounded the encampment of the saints, the beloved city. That's where we are. Zion. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed them. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Um, the great, and then the great white throne. It says, Then I saw a great white throne and one seated on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence, and no place was found for them. I also saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by what was written in the books. It says, Then the sea gave up its dead, and death and Hades gave up their dead. All were judged according to their works. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. That's the second death. And anyone not found in the written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Um, and so, and actually, I don't know, I close it. I guess I am going to go into Revelations 21, and it talks about the new heaven and the new earth. Um, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. So once that's all thrown in all the bad parts are thrown into the into hell that's when the new heaven, you know um for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea no longer existed we're not no longer being tossed around in the sea we're in the new heaven and the new earth <laughs> no longer being tossed around by the sea the sea no longer existed i saw the holy city new jerusalem coming down out of heaven from god Prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. It says, look, God's dwelling is with humanity and he will live with them. He and he will, 
or yes, God's dwelling is with humanity and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with him, them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will no longer exist. Grief, crying and pain will exist no longer because the previous things have passed away. He said it's, and then the one seated on the throne says, look, I'm making everything new. He also said, right, because these words are faithful and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give water as a gift to the thirsty from the spring of life. It's done. It's already done. And he's offering the water of life to all of us. He says, the victor will inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son. But the cowards, unbelievers, vile, murderers, sexual, immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So whoever receives the actual gift of life from the, the drinks of his water and eats of his bread will inherit it. That's why the work of God is to believe. Why it says the cowards and unbelievers, you know, the ones that refuse to believe. It says, then one of the seven angels who held the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came and spoke with me. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. He then carried me away in the spirit um, to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Arrayed with God's glory, his radiance was like a very precious stone, like jasper stone, bright as crystal. The city had a massive high wall with 12 gates. Twelve angels were at the gates. The names of the 12 tribes of Israel's sons were inscribed on the gates. There were three gates in the east, three gates in the north, three gates in the south, and three gates in the west. The city wall had 12 foundations, and the 12 names of the, of the tw lambs, Twelve apostles were on the foundations. It says, The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out in the square. Its length and width are the same. He measured the city. I guess I don't really need to go into that part. Um, and it's talking about the different um, foundations of precious stones, you know, jasper, sapphire, and that's what he's making us into living stones. It says the 12 gates are 12 pearls. Each individual gate was made of a single pearl. The broad street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. I love that. And I love that that's what he says the kingdom of heaven is like. <laughs> you know, um, we found a pearl and, and we reburied it and sold everything we had to, to be able to, you know, to buy that field with that pearl in it. Um, it says, I did not see a sanctuary in it because the Lord got... The Almighty and the Lamb are its sanctuary. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it because God's glory illuminated, illuminates it. And its lamp is the Lamb. Jesus is our light right now. But it won't be here the whole, you know, much longer. It's going to go away. The nations will walk in its light. And the kings of the, of the earth will bring their glory into it. Each day its gates will never close because it will never be night there. The gates are not closed. They will bring its glory and honor. They will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Nothing profane will ever enter it. No one who does what is vile or false, but only those written in the Lamb's book of life. So that's why he says, I'm going to let you in and out of the gate, the pasture. So then he showed me the river of light, living water, sparkling like crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And down the middle of the broad street of the city, the tree of life was on both sides of the river bearing 12 kinds of fruit. Very fruits of the spirit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for healing the nations. The leaves of the tree are for healing the nations. So it's not been healed yet. And there will no longer be any curse. The throne of God and and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his slaves will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Night will no longer exist, and people will not need lamplight or sunlight, because the Lord God will give them light. And they will reign forever and ever. 
So not only do you get to reign for the thousand years, but forever and ever. It says that then he said to me, These words are faithful and true, and the Lord the and the Lord the God of the spirits of the prophets has sent his angel to show his slaves what must quickly take place. It must quickly take place. You can't, you know, receive the spirit and just go back to our old life and expect it to happen. He says, Look, I'm coming quickly. The one who keeps the prophetic words of this book is blessed. It says, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. When I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. <laughs> it's true. You do do that. I mean, maybe not necessarily fall down, but I hide myself in my mantle. <laughs> See, Elijah did. That's what I do. That's my, <laughs> that's my falling down on my face is hiding myself. Like, oh my gosh, that's heavy. Um... But he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow slave with you, your brothers, the prophets, and those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Don't worship prophets. Don't worship the, you know, worship God. Don't bow down to me just because I know a lot. So don't, don't, please don't worship God. I don't know nothing without him. He also said to me, don't seal the prophetic words of this book because the time is near. It says, let the unrighteous go on in unrighteousness. Let the filthy go on being made filthy. Let the righteous go on in righteousness. And let the holy go on being made holy. It says, look, I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me to repay each person according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexual and immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and the everyone who loves and practices lying. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to attest these things to you for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. Rises in your hearts. I love you, Jesus. You're so good to us. Both the spirit and the bride say, come. Since I'm part of that bride, I say, come. Anyone who hears should say, come, and the one who is thirsty should come. Whoever, if you desire this living water, come. You should take it. Take it as a gift. It says, should take the living water as a gift. I testify to everyone who hears the prophetic words of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to that, him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this prophetic book, God will take away his share of the tree of life and the holy city written in this book. He who testifies about these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Hallelujah and amen. You know, um, we're not to worry about what we see. You know, I still am tempted to, you know. Um, but that's, you know, me deceiving myself. And... Um, the first covenant, here's uh, another scripture that's not in Revelation that confirms this. Hebrews 8. Says. Thirteen. A heavenly priesthood. Actually, I'm going to start at the, the beginning of um, Hebrews Eight. It says, now the main point of what is being said is this. We have this kind of high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary in the true tabernacle that was set up by the Lord and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it was necessary for this priest to also, also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he wouldn't be a priest, since there are those offering the gifts prescribed by the law. These serve as a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. As Moses was warned when he was about to complete the tabernacle. For God said, be careful that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. But Jesus has now attained a superior ministry. And to that degree, he is the mediator of the better covenant, which has been legally enacted on better promises. It's legally enacted. I love it. It says, for if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion for a second one. We wouldn't have needed it. But finding fault with his people, he says, look, 
The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their ancestors on the day I took them by their hands to lead them out of Egypt. I disregarded them, says the Lord, because they did not continue in my covenant. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And each person will not teach his fellow citizen and each his brother saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their wrongdoing, and I will never again remember their sins. By saying a new covenant, he has declared that the first is old, and what is old and aging is about to disappear. And so this is Hebrews 9. Um, it says, now the first covenant... Um, now the first covenant also had regulations for ministry in an earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was set up, and in the first room which is called the holy place, where the lamps stand, the table, and the presentation loaves. Behind the second curtain, the tabernacle was called the most holy place. It contained the gold altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant, covered with gold on all sides, in which there was a gold jar containing the manna. Aaron's staff that budded and the tab tablets of the covenant, the cherubim of the glory were above it, overshadowing the mercy seat. And by the way, I did a video on the, the um, cherubim and the sword that are guarding the Garden of Eden that might help you in this as well. You know, and explain the gate of heaven um, a little bit better, you know, to the extent that he gave me to explain it, I suppose is the best way to phrase that. It is not possible to speak about these things in detail right now. With these things set up in this way, the priests enter the first room repeatedly, performing their ministry. But the high priest alone enters the second room, and he does that only once a year and never without blood which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was making it clear even then that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed while the first tabernacle was still standing. He says this is a symbol for the present time during which gifts and sacrifice are offered, sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the worshiper's conscience. That's why going to church once a week and that's why you know, just reading your Bible every day, it's not gonna, it's not gonna give you the joy and the shalom. And that's why you're looking at me like I'm crazy. And I'm sorry, I hate that. I hope that God, you know, uses me well. I know that he will. I will say that for your benefit. But I know that he will. Whether I see it or not. All right. I want you to know, I promised him, or I've, sorry, I've told him that I do not care if I don't see the fruits of my labor or in my life that I do not care but that at least you know that there would be <laughs> right um, he says they are physical regulations and only deal with food drink and various washings imposed until the time of restoration now this is the new covenant mystery it says but the Messiah appeared high priest of the good things that have come in the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. He entered the most holy place once and for all, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a young cow, sprinkling those who are defiled, sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of the Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Cleanse our consciences from dead works to serve the living God. <laughs> Way more. It says, therefore, he is the mediator of the new covenant, so that those who are called might receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Because a death has taken place for redemption from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Where a will exists, the death of one who made it must be established. It says, for a will is valid only when people die, since it never is never enforced while the one who made it is living. It says that is why even the first covenant was inaugurated with blood. For when every command had been proclaimed by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats along with water, scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God has commanded for you. This is in the same way he sprinkled the tabernacle and all the articles of worship with blood. 
According to the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. This is therefore it was necessary for the copies of these things in heaven, in the heavens rather, to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves to be purified with better sacrifices than these. For the Messiah did not enter the sanctuary with hands, only a model of the true one, but into heaven itself, so that he might now appear in the presence of God for us. He did not do this to offer himself many times as the high priest enters the sanctuary yearly with the blood of, uh, of another. Um, it says otherwise he would have to suffer many times since the foundation of the world. But now he has appeared one time at the end of the ages for the removal of sin by the sacrifice of himself. It's already done. It's already done. And just as it is appointed for the people to die once and after this judgment, so also the Messiah, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, and not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. And so, take your judgment now. <laughs> just receive it. Just say, you know, like, there's times where, you know, I just have said, you know what, whatever you say, I'm guilty of, Father God, I am. I admit it. And if I need to specifically admit it, then you need to help me do that, you know. Like, he's not going to leave you. He's not going to abandon you um, <coughs> to, to, to fall. You know, that would go against his own nature. So, in Isaiah, you know, um, when it says, you know, the old water order has passed away in Revelations, you know, there's, there'll be a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. You know, this was prophesied about as well in Isaiah, and it talks about it in Ephesians 2 as well. But I'm going to start with um, Isaiah 43. It's in Isaiah 43 and 65. Um, 43, 19. Actually, I'm going to start at 18. Actually, no, I'm sorry. I'm going to start at 14. God's deliverance of rebellious Israel. This is, this is what the Lord... Your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, says, "Because of you, I will send to Babylon, and bring, or because of you, I will send to Babylon and bring all of them as fugitives, even the Chaldeans and the ships in which they rejoice. I am Yahweh, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King." It says, "This is what the Lord says: Who makes a way in the sea, and a path through the surging waters? He can even make a way if you're being tossed about in the sea right now. He can make a way there too." says, who brings out the chariot and horse, the army and the mighty one together. They lie down. They do not rise again. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the past events. Pay no attention to things of old. Look, I am about to do something new. Even now what is coming? Do you, do you not see it? Indeed, I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. The animals of the field will honor me. Jackals and ostriches. Because I provide water in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen people. The people I formed for myself will declare my praise. It says, but Jacob, you have not called on me because Israel, you have become weary of me. You have not brought me your sheep for burnt offerings or offered me with your sacrifices, honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with the offerings or wearied you with incense. You have not bought me aromatic cane, aromatic cane with silver or satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices. But you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. It is I who sweep away your transgressions for my own, for his own sake. He does it for his own sake. And remember your sins no more. It says, take me to court. Let us argue our case together. State your case so that you may be vindicated. Your first father sinned and your mediators have rebelled against me. So I defiled the officers of the sanctuary and set Jacob apart for destruction and Israel for abuse. Um, Israel, uh, so it's to keep us humble. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I don't know why we can't just have goodness and just like receive it without corrupting it. I don't know either. I don't know. God alone knows our hearts. Um, Isaiah 65, 17. But there's hope. That's the thing that I... Sorry. <laughs> I'm very itchy. Um, but, but there's hope. Okay, so that's where I'm getting that now. This is a new creation. It says, For I will create a new heaven and a new earth. The past events will not be remembered or come to mind. 
and be glad and rejoice forever for what I am creating I, in what I'm creating. For I will create Jerusalem to be a joy and its people to be a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. The sound of weeping and crying will no longer be heard in her. In her, a nursing infant will no longer live only a few days, or an old man not live out his days. Indeed, the youth will die at a hundred years, and the one who misses a hundred years will be cursed. People will build houses and live in them, and they will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will not build, and others live in them. It says, um, they will not plant, and others eat. For my people's lives will be be like the lifetime of a tree. My chosen ones will fully enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor without success or bear children destined for disaster, for they will be a people blessed by the Lord, along with their descendants. And remember, you know, Paul called lots of people our children. He calls us our children. So he's not just talking about your physical children. Um, he says women will be, you know, um, I can't remember the word by childbirth, you know. Um, Even before they call, I will answer. While they will, they are still speaking. I will hear. He does actually. There's times where I'll just be like, Lord, and before I even say what I need, He's like, here you go. <laughs> you know, it's true. He does. You see, it's you're not wrong. The wolf and the lamb will feed together. And the lion will eat straw with like the ox, but the serpent's food will be dust. They will not do what is evil or destroy on my entire holy mountain, says the Lord. So you're safe. And even when he sends you out, you know, like you're not, like you're still safe. Even when he sends you out among the wolves, <laughs> as he says he will. Um, and so I have a few more scriptures. Ephesians 2 and Ephesians 4. Um, I'm just going to read a part of Ephesians 2 and a part of Ephesians 4 because, you know, those are ones that I've kind of gone over a lot um, and did many videos on and, and, and still are part of my foundation scripture 100%. Um, it says... From death to life, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler who exercises authority over the lower heavens. We're in the heavens with Jesus, though. <laughs> the spirit now working in the disobedient. It says, We all, we too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with the Messiah, even though we were dead in trespasses. You were saved by grace, together with Christ Jesus. He also raised us up and seated us in the heavens so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. It says, for you are saved by grace through faith. This is not from yourselves. I'm going to read that for again. Together with Christ Jesus, he also raised us up and seated us in the heavens so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works so that no one can boast, for we are his creation created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them and you know there should be unity in christ if there's not unity in christ we're not following him um it says in, in this confirms it in ephesians 4 it says therefore i a prisoner for the lord urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness with patience accepting one another in love diligently keeping the unity of the spirit with the shalom that binds us there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in all. That's it. Now, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of the Messiah's gift. So, if somebody's not been given, a, um, like, a lot of grace, we need to just pour it out on them. Because, you know, that... That's, I don't know. 
So when he ascended on high, he took prisoners into captivity. He gave gifts to people. But what does he ascended mean when he descended to the lower parts of the earth? The one who descended is above the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. So that's what he wants. He wants to fill all things. And he personally gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the training of the saints in the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's son, growing into a mature man with the stature measured by Christ's fullness, not by ours. Then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching by human cunning, with cleverness, and the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head of Christ. Hallelujah and amen. Jesus' name, hallelujah and amen. From him, the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. Um as you took off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, and you are being renewed in the spirit of your mind. You put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of truth. And so now we got to speak truth, each one to his neighbor, because we are members of one another. That's why it says to love your neighbor as yourself. You would want somebody to speak truth to you if you were really saved you would be desperate to want people to know this truth because you know they can't save themselves. That is a sign. You're zealous for it. That's a good sign. It says because we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil an opportunity. It says the thief must no longer steal. Instead, he must do honest work with his own hands so that he has something to share with anyone in need. No foul language is to come from your, own, from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need, so that it gives grace to those who hear. And don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. It says it in Ephesians. This is all bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting, and slander must be removed from you along with all malice. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you. And in Ephesians chapter 5 and chapter 6, it talks about the, um, you know, light versus darkness. And this is how, this is our warfare. This is what our true battle is. This is Ephesians 6 chapter, or chap, Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 18. It's, it's a, it's got to be a foundation scripture for y'all. I'm not saying that praying every day, every day is going to do it, but it, you know, I just pray that God gives it to you in the way that you need it personally. Says, finally be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the tactics of the devil. For our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against other human beings, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, which those are, that those can be human beings. Against the world powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. It says, this is why you must take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having prepared everything to take your stand. It says, stand therefore with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. It says, in every situation, take the shield of faith and with it you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. It says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is God's word. It says, pray at all times in the spirit. With every prayer and request, every prayer and request, you pray in the Spirit. And stay alert in this with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. It says, pray also for me that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth to make known the boldness of the mystery, boldness, with boldness, the mystery of the gospel. It says, for this I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might be bold enough in him to speak as I should. I pray that for all of us. Shalom to you, brothers, in love with the faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is grace be with all who have undying love for our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and First Timothy 6. Talks about 
like this as well. About fighting the good fight, um, the faith, um, false doctrine, and human greed. It says, teach and encourage these things. It says, if anyone teaches other doctrine that does not agree with the sound teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ and with the teaching that promotes godliness, he is conceited, understanding nothing, but he has a, understanding nothing, but he has a sick interest in disputes and arguments over words. From these come envy, quarreling, slander, evil suspicions, and constant disagreement among people whose minds are depraved and deprived of the truth who imagine that godliness is a way to material gain. <laughs> nope. It says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. It says, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into the temptation, a trap. And But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap. And many foolish and harmless desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But you, man of God, woman of God, child of God, run from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight for the faith. Take hold of eternal life that you were called to and have made a good confession about in the presence of many witnesses. It says, in the presence of God who gives life to all and of Christ Jesus, who gave a good confession before Pontius Pilate, I charge you to keep the command without fault or failure until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. It says, God will bring this about in his own time. He is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the only one who has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light. No one has seen him or can see him. To be to him be honor and eternal mind. And it even goes on to say, you know, the instructions to the rich. It says, instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God, who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good reserve, for the age to come so that they may take hold of a life that is real a life that is real hallelujah um so in philippians 2 and the reason i'm going back to philippians 2 is because um you know it talks about you know we talk about deliverance and salvation and so i'm using that as kind of what i'm going to use as to describe that in um, Hebrew. Philippians um, 2, 13. Actually, I'm just going to go ahead and start with 12. It says, So then, my dear friends, just as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you, enabling you both to, both to desire and to work out his good purpose. Um, you know, it says, do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure children of God who are faultless and a crooked and perverted generation. So you can be, you know, perfect even here among whom you shine like stars in the world. It says, hold firmly to the message of life. Then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. But even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. In the same way, you should also be glad and rejoice for me. I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. So what does he mean, you know, when we say, you know, deliverance and salvation? Um, in Hebrew, you know, it's Yeshua. That, you know, the, the word that I, you know, I, um, the name that I call Jesus, Yeshua, is actually, you know, lowercase. It means to rescue, to save, to, to deliver. Um, Moshaya, you know, which is, you know, um, the, I can't remember the, you know, like it's like the, the action verb of it, I guess it's, it's, it means one causing another to be rescued. It's translated as deliverer or savior and the root word for Yeshua is relief or translated as help. Joshua, um, which is, you know, um, the, I guess, English 
name we would call um, Yeshua. You know, it's the um, Hebrew name, Joshua. It means Yah is rescue. And forgive me if I'm not saying that right. But regardless, the name, his name is Joshua, which I didn't actually know. Somebody actually told me that. And I was like, what? What? Yes, Yeshua is Joshua. Yah is rescue. Jesus is our deliverance. He is our salvation. Um, it also can mean um, makes wide, makes sufficient. Freedom from distress, ability to um, pursue one's own way. Safety, welfare. You're able to pursue the way that Jesus wants you to. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, and that'll be the last scripture. Um, one through four. And the reason I'm ending it is because he wants it for all of us. It says, first of all then, I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone. For kings and all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. It says, this is good and it pleases our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and come to the full knowledge of the truth. That's everybody. It says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and humanity, Christ Jesus himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. And we will need that testimony. You know, if you don't have that testimony, if you can't stand on the testimony that he's giving you now, and you're wanting Jesus to come, how can you stand when he comes? So that's why I want you to have that. I want you to have it. And I pray for you. I do. I pray and I intercede and I petition. And so I love you guys. God bless you guys. And may Yahweh make his face shine upon you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. In Jesus' name, I pray that. I love you. Jesus loves you. God bless you. Bye, guys.